Y'all just continue joining with us as we lift up the great name of Jesus. That's who here we are here to uh, sing about this morning. I was very beneath my shame. What could carry that kind away? It was mine too Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my
Now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old man knew Jesus when I met you. You called my name. I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my to rejoice about. It's something to be excited about. And that is exactly why we sing. Amen. Oh, man. I'm telling you, that's why I, I think I could sing it again, just right, right now. Just one right after the other, right? But you do know in heaven that it's continual worship, right? Um, so uh, if you're not ready now, going to have a hard time in heaven, right? <laughs> and that's, uh, that's, why we, that's why we encourage you. Don't be shy. But just remember who you're singing to. Amen. Give me one sec, y'all. I've lost my place. We did a little uh, rearranging. And you know, it's funny, y'all. I'll just tell you real quick. Uh, you know, it's interesting how the enemy will work because y'all don't know this, but this morning in, in practice, for the last few weeks, uh, several issues with sound and did as well this morning, but, you know, we're just going to sing regardless because we're here to sing about Him. And even with technicalities or even with Wi-Fi issues, whatever it is that's technology, mm, we just put that aside this morning, right? Because that's where our focus is supposed to be. In Hebrews 13, 15, it says, Through Him let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. So let your lips acknowledge his name as we continue this morning.
of us, really, you know, 
circumstances, our choices, our decisions. You never change. You always remain faithful and you always show yourself mighty. And Lord, we just give you all the honor and praise just for who you are. The King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And Father, I just pray that in a moment when the word is taught, Lord, that you would just speak mightily through the vessel, through Scotty. Lord, that you would anoint him with your power. It'd be your spirit that speaks. When it's that way, Lord, there's nothing about anyone getting glory or victory except you, the only one deserving. And Lord, we know right now that you're really wanting to teach us through your word, just like every week that we come, Lord, I know that you are. So I just look forward and anticipate what you have uh, for each and every one of us today. I pray that the hearts would be receptive, ears would be ready to hear, and that the enemy would be bound from this room and from this place in Jesus' name. We just lift you up, Lord, thanking you even now for what you're going to do. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. We weren't going to do this last psalm, but we're going to go ahead and add it. I just feel like we should. Um, it's, it's just the words of this particular song. <laughs> just so greatly define the love that the Father has for you and I. And really, I wasn't going to do it because of, of just simply fear of the unknown, because of the technicalities that we were having this morning. Mm. Let's just go on <laughs> and do it regardless. Yep. And uh, it, it isn't about all that. It's just it's just going to be about what it says. If you don't know it, just look at the words. That's all I need to say. And uncontained, your love is a fire burning bright for me. It's not just a spark, it's not just a flame. Your
troubled mind It is an anxious It's not the restless kind Your love's not passive It's never disengaged It's always present It hangs on every word you say Love keeps its promises It's vows are good. Your love's not broken. It's not insecure. Your love's not selfish. Your love is pure. And you don't give your heart in pieces. No, he does not. I'm so glad, I'm so glad they sung that song. Lord, it just reminds us that your love for us is extravagant. Your word says that you lavish, you lavish your love on us. Even while we were still sinners, you don't give us a drop or two of your blood, Lord. You poured, your blood was poured out for us. You don't give a little breadcrumb here, a little breadcrumb there, just to, just to tease us, Lord. No, you put yourself out there. You've made it 100% clear where you stand. And you absolutely love us. There's no doubt about it. And Lord, we stand in awe of who you are. So Lord, I pray now that we recognize that you love us. That we would respond in the right way. Lord, that we would soak up your love and we would love you right back. And we would do... The greatest thing that you've told us to do, and that is to love you with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with everything that we have, and love our neighbor as ourself. Lord, I thank you for giving us that model to live by, that creed to live by, that example to live by. You say there's no greater love than this, that a man would lay his life down for a friend. Lord, you call us friends. You call us sons and daughters, and we're forever grateful. So, Lord, I pray right now that you'd speak to us through your word where we can understand. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. And everybody says, Amen. Man. Ain't God good? I didn't want to worship the end. How about you? Hey, let's do something different. Look at somebody and smile. Look at somebody and smile. Look at somebody and smile. Now, tell them Jesus loves them. Smile. That's different. Smile. You were made to smile. Tired of the frowny face. Smile. 
I heard somebody say about somebody one day, says, I just love them because they just smile all the time. That's the better option. Some of you are like, I can't believe that preacher just said, make me smile. <laughs> yeah, I did. Don't be offended. <laughs> How about Luke 19? Let's go to the Gospel of Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke. What's after Luke? Hey, y'all folks is learning. Luke 19. Are you excited to be in the house of the Lord? Man, I am too. Been looking forward to seeing you guys today. So why are you turning? And we got Pete back, man. How about old Pete? Man. Old Pete brings energy. Anybody see him get airborne up there? When I ran out of that grave. Hey, that's what I'm talking about. Let the, let the Spirit lead you, brother. Man, yeah. So while you turn into Luke 19, and you may already be there, I want to remind you of what we're talking about. Now let me just say it like this. I don't want you to miss it. Listen to me. What we don't recognize cannot benefit us. What we don't recognize cannot benefit us. Let me just give you an example of something I've learned the last couple of weeks. So I've been pulling a trailer that, that you pull it Oh, with the ball of your truck, like on the back of your bumper is a ball. That's a ball. Your trailer goes on to it, and you pull a trailer from there. Some of you may or may not know that. Well, they make something that's for heavier stuff, and it's called a gooseneck trailer. The gooseneck will go over into the bed of your truck where there's another ball right there if you have that set up, and you can put all the weight over the axles of your truck. Amen. <laughs> anyway, on my truck... I noticed this little thing down under the bumper, and I'm like, what is that? I've never understood what it is. Well, the other day, I put my foot on it, and whoop, here comes this big, huge step. <laughs> I mean, I've been climbing like a monkey over the gooseneck, getting in the back of the truck, when whoop, there we go, step right in the back. I step right on in the back of the truck. Wish I'd have known that. For, I've been having the truck for a year and a half. Didn't even know there was a step. Been climbing over like an old man, right? So my point in saying that is, what we don't recognize can't benefit us. I never saw that. I just thought, like, man, what is that? I never investigated it. Okay? So if you don't recognize it, it cannot benefit you. Okay, here's what I'm talking about. This goes for seasons of our life. Uh, situations in our life, people that's in our life, if we don't recognize what they're there for, if we don't recognize the season, if we don't recognize the situation, if we don't recognize what that person is in our life for, how is it ever going to benefit us? See, God uses seasons, He uses situations, and He uses people, let me give you these four things again, to teach us, to challenge us, to mature us, and to encourage us. Remember that? The seasons are to teach us. God uses seasons. God uses people. God uses situations to teach us, to challenge us. Anybody need challenging in your life right now? Anybody need encouragement? Anybody need to grow? We all need to grow. Now, let's read this in verse 41, Luke 19, verse 41. We read this last week. Just want to touch on it because I want you to understand how sad this is. It says that Jesus, he is coming into Jerusalem. He's coming into his people, right? He, he's coming in on a donkey. And he says this, as he drew near to the city, what did he do, church? We, weep. I mean, it ain't like we do when we drive up into church. We already got our hands up. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. I'm glad at church. No, he rolls into the city to his people, and he just started crying. How sad is that? Anybody pull up to your house and you just start crying? That's not good. <laughs> I don't want to go in there. No, don't say that. So Jesus is pulling up into the city and he's crying over it. Why? Notice what he says in verse 42. If you, my brothers and sisters, my people, if you would have known or if you would have recognized even you 
in your day, this day, your day, the things that make for your peace. Listen to that. What is he saying? He's saying, I'm here. The Messiah is here. Anything and everything that you've ever hoped for, dreamed of, the King is here. Mercy is here. Peace is here. The Savior of the world is here. The Redeemer is here. The lover of your soul is here. The God of all your days is standing right in front of you. But you missed it. Guys, I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss God in my life. And how many times do we miss that? Because we don't recognize seasons, we don't recognize situations, and we don't recognize people that God put in our life. Let me give you another verse, Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5, we see this. Listen, Jesus didn't just happen to pop up on the scene uh, just randomly, you know? He, he wasn't just sitting in heaven one day and saying, you know what, I think I'll go. No, it says this, in the fullness of the time, under God's will, when it was time, it was the season for Jesus to be on the scene, God sent his son. He sent it at the perfect time. He was born of a woman, and he was, he'd come when, when, when the world was under the law. Why? He came to redeem those that are under the law. Watch this. That we might receive adoption as sons. Now, now, now I want you to understand that. He comes during a time that they were oppressed by the Romans, and, and they had all these laws and these regulations. They were, were kind of stuck in the mud, right? And Jesus comes on the scene the perfect time. He's born of a woman. How does that happen? How does God impregnate a woman? Well, he just does. And he did. Why? Because Jesus needed to be human to walk on this earth. You do realize Jesus can't just walk on this earth without being wrapped in flesh. We all would die. That's why he said, Lazarus, come out of the tomb. Because if he would have just said, come out of the tomb, everybody dead would have jumped up. So Jesus walked this earth at the right time in history, right when God wanted him to be here. Why? He came to set the people free. He came to adopt us, all of us. He started with Jerusalem right there. He started with the Jews to come to set free. But they didn't recognize him. How sad is that? Think about that word adoption for a minute. Think if you, if you were an orphan. Some of you may, may have been in here. You were an orphan. And someone come, and you were at the orphanage, and someone come to adopt you. Someone come to adopt you, beautiful, wonderful people, great mom and dad for you. They come to adopt you, but you run and you hide or you take off and you go to the woods. And you just missed being part of a wonderful family with a loving father and a loving mom. How, would that be silly? Would that, how stupid would that be? Many of you know, and I've shared this before, my grandparents drove to Pine Bluff, Arkansas and got me out of a situation where I was living with my mom and a stepdad that was very, 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 very abusive. I'm talking about some things I could tell you that would curl your toes. It was a horrible situation. And they drove and they rescued me. They rescued me out of a situation that I can't even it, it, it begin to tell you about because it will bring me to tears if I try to tell you about it. But how stupid would that be when they come and they bang, were banging on that door to come and rescue me if I would have took out the back door and says, no, I'm not going with you. How stupid would that be? How stupid would that be? Well, this is what Jesus is saying. I've come to you to adopt you, to rescue you, but you won't hear me, you won't believe me, you go on about your ways, and so he's just crying. He's crying over his people. They miss their season. They miss their season to be with the Lord. So they continue to be under the law. What is it under the law? Pretty much being under the law in these days was this. That's a man's way of trying to get to God. Can you imagine, and if people still live like that today, I really feel sorry for you, and I pray that your eyes would be open. You can't get to God. There's nothing you can do to get to God. There's no way to get to God. That's why he had to come to us. 
Religion is getting to God. We don't, we ain't about that. We're about relationship. God came to us. And we rescue that. And if you could ever grasp that, that it, it ain't our effort to get to him, that he came to us and saved us by his mercy and grace, if you could ever get a hold of that, you will be set free. Amen? We can't miss this. So, how did they miss Jesus? Or let's just bring it a little closer home to us. How do you miss Jesus? How do I miss Jesus? How do we miss the will of God for our life? It's real simple. I'll give you a couple of scriptures here. Hosea verse, uh, four, uh, chapter 4, verse 6. The first part of that verse says this. Listen to me. It says, people are destroyed for their lack of knowledge. That, I didn't say that. That's right out of the Bible. We are destroyed for our lack of knowledge. What, what does that mean? You don't, we don't recognize the season that we're in. We don't recognize the people that are in our life. Isaiah 5.13 says this, that his people go into captivity because they have no knowledge. It says honorable, peop honorable men are famished. People are thirsty. The multitudes dry up because they're thirsty. Why? Because they don't recognize the season that they're in. Why are people thirsty these days when there's living water in abundance? I just shared with you that God lavishes his love on you. He lavishes his salvation on us. So why are people thirsty? Why are people thirsty? Because there's no real recognition of living water. There's no real recognition of living water. Why? Because the enemy has blinded us. Or he's got us too busy. He's got us worried about other things. He's blinded us. I remember, I was sitting there thinking about this. My wife, precious wife, and everybody's like, oh, Lord, is this going to be the day she gets up and runs out? <laughs> everybody's waiting on that day. She's like, is she going to get up and run out? No. So, so she was so sweet. And she wanted to surprise me with a real neat weekend. This has been a while uh, back that, that when I got home from work, she put a blindfold on me. And I didn't know which way this thing was going. I was, either way, uh, anyway, she put a blindfold on me, and she said, I already got you some clothes and a bag. We headed somewhere. I was like, oh, my goodness. I mean, this is cool. This is some, this is some stuff right here. So anyway, we get, she leads me to the car. She puts me in the car, and here we go. We start driving and driving and driving. And we turn it. You know, I'm trying to figure out, you know, as a man, like, hey, I know where we're going. We're going this way. We're going to, man, I got so confused. I didn't know where we were. I mean, turning, flipping, flopping. Anyway, anyway, so we arrive at the destination. And remember, I'm blindfolded. And it's been about a 45-minute drive. Okay, so I'm like, I don't know where we're at. She could have went around the block several times and came back home. I didn't even know. <laughs> anyway, when you're blindfolded, you don't recognize where you're at. So here's the thing. <laughs> I got out. She led me out. She pulls the blindfold off. She goes, ta-da. Okay, here's the thing. We're standing in front of a, 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 a this, was, this is a, a, her aunt's house that was sitting on Lake Cherokee. And it's sitting there, the beautiful lake behind it. I mean, it's an awesome place. But when she pulled the blindfold off of me, I guess it was too tight. And it had, like, been mashing my eyes in. And, like, when she, she pulled the blindfold off, I still couldn't see. I could still, like, stick people. I just thought it was a bunch of people, and it was trees, you know. And then I could see all this. I couldn't see where I was at. And she goes, what do you think? I was like, I don't know. I can't see. I knew you wouldn't like it, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I couldn't see. How long was it, baby? Another 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes before I could even see. I'm like, where am I at? I don't even know. I could have been at Walmart. I thought we were at Walmart with the blue. Anyway, the devil can blind you and you be in an awesome place like that in your life, and God's doing something wonderful in your life, but if you can't see it, if you don't recognize it, how are you ever going to enjoy it? Think about it. If I were to ask you right now, and, and we could all stand up and say, I said, hey, what is God doing in your life right now? Okay, let me, I'll just ask you that. Don't, you ain't got to an answer, but I'm asking you, and I want you to tell yourself right now, what is God, and, you, and most of you are going to have to think about this all week, and then you'll, then you'll, oh, this is what God's doing. Listen, what is God doing in your life right now? Because to be honest with, with you, you should recognize what God's doing in your life right now. 
Okay? Why? Because he's either challenging you, he's teaching you, he's encouraging you, maturing you, he could be strengthening you, he could be giving you rest. I don't know. But if we don't recognize what he's doing, how's it going to benefit? How are you going to soak it up? Right? Now, let's go a little deeper. 1 Corinthians 13. Go to your right if you're in Luke 19. What's God doing in your life right now? What's he doing? Is he teaching you something right now? Is maybe he giving you a challenge right now? Do you recognize it? Because here's the thing, you won't recognize it if you worry about everything else. When you get up in the morning, it should be one of the first things you think about. Okay, Lord, thank you for this day. What do you, what do you got for me today? And you may look back in your inventory of what God's been doing, and you think, okay, it's just another day like this. Lord, I want to soak up everything you have for me. Are you trying to give me rest? Are you encouraging me? Don't discount them people that walk up to you. They're there for a reason. Did you make it to 1 Corinthians 13? Okay, look at verse 11. Verse 11. Let me take you through this. When I was a child, Apostle Paul speaking, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. Now, none of that's weird. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Okay, let me tell you what it's not talking about. It's not talking about putting your toys up. If you still play with Star Wars men, that's fine. If you still... <laughs> See, there's somebody been set free today. If you still play with baby dolls, I mean, hey. Here's the thing. At least you're still a kid. Right? But here's the problem. There's a lot... There's a too many people that are mature in their bodies. <laughs> but not, not in the way they act. <laughs> but that's not what it's talking about here. It's talking about... It's not telling the men to put up their PlayStation or the... Or the uh, Xbox, whatever. That's not what it's talking about. Here's what it's talking about. When you were a child, you couldn't discern and recognize things like you can now. True? Okay? You, you, you weren't mature then like you are now. <laughs> let, me, let, me just, let me share this with you. I think it was two Christmases ago, or, or was it last Christmas, baby, when you bought Miss Pac-Man? Last Christmas, during COVID, okay, she went, she found this Atari, but it was, it, okay, you know how you go in the game and you play the thing and it's big, you know, okay, this was a mini one, okay, and it has Galaga, Miss Pac-Man, and Dig Dug, Dig Dug, yeah, I don't know what Dig Dug is, I've never heard of Dig Dug, but anyway, Dig Dug, yeah, all right, Dig Dug, so, we had that during the COVID and during the shutdown. So surely, I, I think that thing was a God sin. So God's not talking about putting away this stuff. Let me tell you something. We got so into that and sh me and her battling for the high score. I mean, it was, it was intense at our house. It really was. But you got to think about it, man. I mean, you can, you can apply the word to, the, to, the, to Miss Pac-Man. I mean, you're on a journey, right? And then, then ghosts are demons, right? You're trying to navigate life and, and, and not run into the demons, but then when you get weak and they come after you, you take a bite of the Word of God and they get vulnerable and then you can eat them, right? Is this not preach or what? But then it's not over. You go to the next screen and they get, demons get faster. Isn't that like, it's not like it life. Demons get faster and they come at you even harder. And you got to take a bite of that Word and you got to pursue them and you got to get them out of there in the name of Jesus. I'm telling you, Miss Pac-Man is, is spiritual. <laughs> See, those screens are seasons. <laughs> yeah. Stage one. Doo -doo 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 -doo, and they chase each other, and then they kids, then they have little babies and things. Anyway, it's awesome. So that verse is not talking about Atari. Okay. Verse 12. <laughs> Here's an example of what they're talking about. For now, for now, we see in a mirror dimly. But then, 
face to face. Listen at that. Childish ways, you're looking at life like through, a, through the shower door. We just had a new shower door put on our, in our shower, right? And it's got, it's got you can't really see, you kind of see an image in there, but you can't really see. I'm not going to go into that any further, but you know what I'm talking about? Or, or like somebody's front doors have a design on it, and it's got like that glass on it. You can see an image back there, but you really can't tell who it is. See, that's who, when we're a child, it's like we're looking through the shower glass, right? Now he says, now I know in part, but then I shall know also, uh, you know it. In other words, as you, as, you, as you mature, you see stuff the way, the way it's supposed to be. Is this making sense to anybody? Okay. Now, if, 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 here's the thing about not being mature in the faith. Okay, it'd be like somebody knocking on your door, and you got one of those glasses things, and you see... And it looks like somebody you want to talk to, and you don't open the door. And it could be somebody standing there with a pecan pie. But if you don't recognize that that's somebody with a pecan pie, you're not going to open up the door, and you're not going to benefit from the pecan pie. Or it could be Publishers Clearing House. They'd have a check waiting on you. I've been waiting on that one. But that, that's never happened. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. But that's, if, you don't, if you don't recognize... The season, the people, the situation, how is it going to benefit you, Finchy, right? Okay, let's just, let's just look at this. I, want you, I really want you to get a hold of this. Okay. Think about children. They, they can't discern stuff like mature adults, right? Okay, you take a baby. You take a baby, and baby may not know he has a bad diaper, but he knows something's wrong, so he, just, she, he or she just starts crying. Okay, as an adult, we can walk by and you're like, hmm, I need to change them, right? It kind of hits you. As an adult, you're like, I know where that come from. So, I, I, you know, right? You, 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 and and then the baby, all the baby is, it may feel heavy or whatever. whatever. You, or you, when you pick them up, you think that thing heavy, you know, you, know, you know what's going on. You're like, hey, I need to change the baby. So what do you do? You put the baby up on the changing table or wherever you change the baby, and you, and you start the process, and when that cold wipe hits that rear end, that kicking and screaming is happening. I mean, it's not, I don't know about your kids, but my kids are hard to change the diaper. It's hard to hit a moving target. And they're on that changing table just acting a fool, you know, and you get them all cleaned up, and you finally put the shit on it, and we're good, right? Then they finally calm down. But the whole process, the baby is making it hard on you. And all you're trying to do is help them out. Yeah. Now, the adult knows what's best. Let me clean you up and get you going. But the baby's resisting, right? Think about it. Seasons are like the changing table. Okay? God is wanting to put us up there and change our diaper. <laughs> He's wanting to clean the mess in our life. But we're on the changing table like a baby... Ah! Right? And we're not let, and all he's doing is, I'm trying to clean you up. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying to you? Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? We, we, we kicking and screaming, whining and complaining, and all God is doing is trying to clean us up. He gonna put the powder on there. And if it's real red, he'll write that stuff that never comes off. I don't know what that stuff is. What's that stuff? The white stuff? Butt paste. Yeah, I like that word. Just put it on there. Now that I'm grown, I use monkey butt. But anyway, <laughs> hey, when you work hard and sweat, you need a little something, something down there. Anyway, I don't know how we get off into this stuff. The process of the changing table is what God is doing in our life. And if we don't realize that God, all he's doing is trying to clean the mess up, and if, okay, we're going to kick and scream. Listen to me. So now that you're in a season and you, and you recognize he's teaching me, he's challenging me, he's encouraging me, he's, he's maturing me, okay, Lord, then I'm going to sit here and I'm going to smile at him and, and I'm going to goo and guy at him and let him do what he got to do. Does anybody hear me today? Wouldn't it be so much better and so much easier if we just let him get the mess out of our life? Then you can walk around a little lighter. 
I said, Lord, put some of that powder on me. I'm good with it. See, here's the deal. The hope in our kids is one day they would realize and go to the bathroom their self. Okay? Then you ain't got to do all that. And the parents say, amen. Amen. Right? One day, you're going to hear the lid go up, if it's a boy, hopefully, ladies, and you're going to hear that noise. And what are you going to do? Thank you, Jesus. No more of that. Right? So what have you done? He's learned, learned, he or she's learned through the season to be able to do it on their own. Okay, same thing with us and God. He wants to get us through these seasons where we'll quit messing on ourselves and be able to handle a little bit more on our own without Him having to intervene and have a season to teach us over and over again the same thing, right? You don't be six years old cleaning up the diapers, right? Now, let's, let, okay, think about, let's think about it now. Let me give you a better, better word, okay. Some of us have kids or grandkids. If you get out of the car in the parking lot, what's the first thing you're going to do when they hop on that asphalt? Grab their hand. Why? Because they can't discern that those moving cars can hurt them. Okay? We, we grab their hand. Walk them rascals right on up there. Now, especially, like, if you go into the playground, once you get to that fence, you can let them go. Because it's an environment that you can trust them in. But out here where all the stuff is going on, we can't trust them right there. That's why we let their hand go in here, and we hold their hand here. Okay, think about it. Same with us and God. God could be holding our hand in this season right now, Teaching us, challenges, encourages, matures to where he can finally trust us in the environment to let our hand go. Now, I'm not talking about let your hand go like for good. You're on your own now. Bless you, son. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in the situation of the seasons of your life, you have matured where you can see the dangers and the temptations and the fears and the worries are not going to overtake you anymore because God has been holding your hand. He's been telling you no, 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 no. And now you no, 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 no to stay away from that, 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 that. And he can let go of your hand. I hope this is making sense to y'all today. Maturity recognizes the changing table. And it will adapt. Maturity recognizes the need for God to hang on to our hand. And we adapt to it. And listen, we become thankful for that whole process. Think about Paul, and I'm, I'm just going to give you this, and I'll quote some of this for time's sake, but it, you can find this. This is some home joy for you. 2 Corinthians 12, you'll find that the Apostle Paul, God, God gives him a thorn. Now, it's not an actual thorn. He didn't get caught up in the briars, right? No, God has given him, the Word says, a messenger of Satan to keep getting his attention. To, to, the Bible says to buffet him, to keep, to, keep, to keep him humble, okay? Now, we don't know exactly what it is, but it was something that kept him humble, okay? Here's what Paul did. As soon as he got the thorn, he says, Lord, please take this away from me. Now, you may have something in your life right now, and you've been asking, Lord, take this away, take this away. And then, and then he doesn't, and then, then, then Paul says again, please, Lord, take this thing away. He said it three times. He asked the Lord three times to take this thorn, take this, this humbling mechanism out of my life. And watch what God's response is. I put it on the screen. He simply says to him, my grace is sufficient for you. Yeah. What? What? See, see those, those times of things are like, why? He said, he said, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Now, this is hard for us to get a hold of. But church, when you say that you have grace, when you say you have the grace of God, do you realize what you have? We honestly don't need another thing other than His grace. You woke up today because of His grace. You're breathing because of His grace. You're saved because of His grace. 
What else do you need? So what? You got the pain. No, you don't want it. But if God says the pain is for a reason, if the pain is for a reason, if the pain is for the season, if the pain is teaching you something, then this pain's a good thing. That's hard. That's hard to swallow. Grace, you got grace, man, then everything else is awesome. But you got the pain. But the pain is making you strong, right? It's strengthening you. So Paul kicking and screaming when God said, hey, my grace is sufficient, it calmed him down. Let me give you his response. Here's Paul's response to all this. He says, well, hey, well, if that's true, God, I'm going to boast in this. I'm going to boast in this pain. I'm going to take pleasure in seasons and infirmities and needs and persecutions and all that. Because, Lord, when I'm weak, you're strong. So I guess well, here's what I'm trying to say to you. If we'll become thankful for the seasons instead of kicking and screaming while we're on the changing table, things will go a whole lot smoother. Let's take it a little further. Let's go to Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3. Some of this you may not think you need, but it's, it'll hit you this week or next. You'll be like, <clears throat> man, thank you, Lord, for that. I understand now what I'm going through. I thought Brother Scott is just up there talking. No. No. You got to realize, church, everything that I say to you, I truly believe God has given, given it for us. I say for us. Because I get more, probably more out of it than y'all do. You got to realize I study this for eight or ten hours before I give it to you. And there's a lot of it that kicks my tail that I don't even share with y'all. Because some of that stuff's just for me. And then some of it just for all of us. But I truly believe what I'm giving you is for you. You may not be going through it right now. You may be in a season of rest right now. But then you got somebody else that's in a, in a, in a season of the changing table. You know? But then when you come out of your season of rest, maybe you may go to the changing table. Who knows? Who knows? But when you're in it, be thankful for it. Proverbs 3. Now, this is for those that, that, that may, you may feel like you're stuck on the changing table. Or maybe you just think God's mad at you. Do you realize God is always on time? Look at verse 27. Now, this is, a, this is an encouragement to us, and, and I'm, we're gonna, we'll get to it. I'm going to explain all this to you. The proverb is, is wisdom. Proverbs are, are wisdom. Remember, we, we, we just read that we're destroyed for the lack of knowledge. We're destroyed by lack of wisdom. Well, here's some wisdom. Do not withhold good from those to whom it's due. Do. When it is in the power of your hand to do so. Now, in a nutshell, that would be okay. The Lord's moving on you to help somebody out, and you got the means to help them out, and you feel led to help them out, help them out. Right? Does that make sense? Now, but let's dig into it a little, little more. When you see the word do, or you hear the word do, especially here, do as D-U-E, okay, it's always attached to a time frame. Do like due season. Galatians 6, 9 tells us, uh, we used this last week, let us not grow weary of doing good because in due season you will reap if you don't lose heart. That was a big encouragement last week for those that are, that are fighting the good fight. Your mamas and daddies, you're doing all you can. Don't lose heart, you're doing good. In due season you will reap. When that time frame comes, you will reap a harvest. You're pouring into them kids. You're pouring into them kids. You're teaching them Jesus, not the crazy world. At some point, you're going to see the fruit of that. Just ask Chris Bohannon. What did he do? He's been pouring into little Hunter, pouring into little Hunter, pouring into little Hunter. And last week, we see him get baptized right up here. And what was the one thing he said? He said, little, you want to say something, little buddy? He said, I sure do. Six years old, I love God. Come on with it. Preach it, brother. I love God. If that's all you get all week, that's good. I love God because he loved me. Due season. 
due season. Now, okay, there's always some respect around due season. Okay, let me, let me show what I mean. Uh, you may get paid on the 1st and 15th. You got respect for those days. <laughs> Amen? I mean, you don't, you don't, when you know that your paycheck is due on the 1st and 15th, and you go by the boss's office, you know, and it's the, the, the 29th, you don't go, where's my money? Because you know it's not due yet, right? But on the 1st, you want to know where my money is. Because you're not up there for your health. You're up there to work. You're up there for a paycheck. And then men, you wonder why men like to go out on Friday night or whenever they get paid or whatever? It's because they like to see some fruit. They like to enjoy what they've worked so hard for. Hope that makes sense. But there's always a respect around a due date. You think about those. I, I, I see John sitting right here, and I think about he And Joel, too. They got rent houses. I guarantee you on the, due, the rent due date, there's some expectations on that day. And the people that are renting them homes, they need to have some respect for that day because if they don't pay their rent, get up out of my house, right? Is this making sense to anybody? Okay. Babies do. There's a healthy respect for that day too. <laughs> anyway, there's certain certain respect when something's due. Well, the proverb here is telling us to be sensitive, to be sensitive to the due date and the due seasons. You may be in somebody's life right now because their season is going to come due on your watch and God may ask you to help them. Right? But here's what you got to be able to do. You got to be able to discern, you got to be able to discern when to help and when not to help because you don't help when it's out of season. Okay? Let, let me just let me just say say this. Uh, my little boys, I have a big power washer, right? Kicking out about 3,500 PSI. There's no way I'd put the twins on that. I mean, they would, they would have the tree cut down with the water. They would have our windows busted out. I mean, and each other. I mean, they'd have scars all over. I could imagine. It's not their season to run it. Their season's coming. Ain't that right, Shane? No. <laughs> But this is not their season. Now, I got the power to let them have the keys to that thing and use it, but I'm not going to do it. It's not their season. Shane, on the other hand, can handle it. I've seen him handle it. He, he can handle it, man. He's been handling it. I let him have it. It's his season right now. Oh, and he's working for it, too. It's his season, right? Let me just say it like this. Okay. If, if, if someone that was an alcoholic came up to me and they say, he said, hey, Brother Scotty, can, can you hit me up with $20? But I know, because there's been no change and we're standing beside Harley's, and I'm saying this because this has happened, standing, out, standing beside, you know, Harley's is down the road, and right there, I can see it, and I have given this before, helping somebody out, and where do they go? They come out, go in there, come out with a brown bag. You know what's happening, Okay. Well, when I've had that happen, and, I, and I've seen that before, I know that this $20 is not going to benefit them because they're going to go right in there and continue their addiction. So I'm not going to give that. It's not their season. Have the means to do it, but I'm going to withhold that because I don't want to uh, enable them. Okay? Now, if that person says, hey, Brother Scotty, I'm, hung, I'm saying this because I was on Highway 80 standing at Taco Wayno, and the Harleys was like a couple of doors down, and this is happening to me in this parking lot. Okay? If that person will say to me, Brother Scotty, can, can, I'm starving to death, I would immediately, immediately say, let's go inside. Because now it's season for that. And I'm not going to withhold how God's blessed me so I can bless you. You, you see what I'm saying? There, there's a big difference in that. All right? So read it again. Notice the criteria. Don't withhold good when someone's due for it. And, and the discernment and the recognition is we've got to realize when it's good for them and when it's not. You, you, you know when, when your kids are not big enough to be outside by themselves. Okay? You got, it's the same thing. You've got to discern the people in your life and what they're due and what they're not due. Okay? And when it's in your power to hand to do so. So you have the power to do some things, but just because you have the power to do it doesn't mean you do it when it's not seasoned for it. 
Here's what I'm saying. If God gives us, y'all listen, don't miss this. If God gives us this principle right here that we just read, don't withhold good from those who it is due, and when you have the power in your hand to do so. If God gave us that principle to live by, don't you think he keeps his own commandments? Okay. That means when we read, do not withhold good from those that are due, that's the heart of God. Oh, and he has the power to do so. But listen to me. Just because God has the power to do something doesn't mean he's going to do it. Because we may not be due season, right? If you'd have went out and killed you a deer last Saturday, you'd have got a ticket. If you go kill one yesterday, like Hunter did and Chris, you got meat in the freezer. Okay? There's a difference between season and not season. <laughs> okay? Do see what's right. So here's what God's doing. He's got the power to do it, but if he doesn't do it, don't get mad at him, get offended. It's just not your season. It's just not your season. It may not be right for us. So maturity is going to recognize this church and trust. At the end of the day, you trust God and his timing is perfect. If he doesn't withhold good when it's due. In other words, when it's due, he's going to pour the good on you. You know what I'm saying? Hope you're getting this. He's not going to withhold anything. Here's what all I'm doing today, church, is trying to encourage you to trust the process. Trust the process that God uses to teach us, to mature us, encourage us, and challenge us. Because the enemy... He wants you to get mad at God. You're wondering why you're not better. You're wondering why this is not going right. You're wondering why that's not going right. And you, you get all stirred up about it. God's just simply saying, it's not your season. It's not time. And you've got to recognize, trying to recognize what he's doing. Don't get offended, him, offended at him while he's changing your diaper or holding your hand. Oh, don't you? My kids, they try to jerk loose, man. Mm, which they get a little bigger now, they can, they can, they, they, they can handle it. Barely. But, <laughs> but don't jerk, what did mama say? Don't jerk away from me. Don't jerk away from me. And that's what God's doing. Listen, don't jerk away from me. But here he is. He gives us free will. And he'll let us jerk away from him. I can't tell you how many times I've jerked away from him. So, do not withhold good from those whom it is due when it is in your power of your hand to do so. Let me tell you this. I'm, I'm nearly finished. There's nothing more rewarding than God using you to play a part in someone else's due season. I ain't kidding y'all. I look, I look around this room and I think of how God has used me somehow, some way in your life and to be a part of that, that's special. And, and, I, and I look around at y'all's life and how y'all been a part of others' lives, like this, church family, right? Yeah. And it blesses my heart. I mean, I know it's kind of weird, but like when I see y'all talking amongst each other and smiling at each other, you know, that makes me feel good. But to be a part of it and to see change and to see people walk through seasons and then know they don't struggle. Like, like I've spent some time with some of y'all in certain seasons and, and now you're past that and then I see you have the chance to retake that test again but you don't have to because you got it nailed down and you come on through it. It's just so beautiful and so rewarding. So guess what I'm saying to, saying to you. If, if God wants you in someone's life for a season, man, don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. Let him use you for his glory. We should never want to miss that opportunity. I'm going to close right here. Now, you may need to go to the table of contents to find this book. <laughs> but <laughs> it's Habakkuk. Everybody knows where Habakkuk is, don't you? It's going to be to the right of Proverbs. That's about the best I can tell you. Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, if that helps you. 
Or you could just look at the screen and say, be humble and say, Brother Scott, I don't know where that is. I'll practice that one later. Table of contents will give you the page number, though. We're going to close right here. Habakkuk. I'll give you three things right now that, that we all need to get in our crawl. Remember, we all have a crawl. Chickens have a crawl. We got a crawl. Our crawl is our heart. It doesn't grind rocks like turkeys and chickens. But you know what turkeys and chickens eat? Rocks. Because they has got to get in their crawl, and that's what helps them chew up the food. I ain't eating no rocks. Okay, this is Habakkuk. Okay, chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 1, read to verse 3. We'll be out of here. He says this. Now put yourself in his shoes. Anybody find it? Everybody find it? He says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart, in other words, up high, like a deer stand, and watch to see what he, see the capital, will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Okay. It's Habakkuk standing high. He's going through something in his life, and he's saying, Lord, I don't understand. I know it's a season. Are you teaching? Are you correcting? Are you challenging? Are you maturing me? What are you doing, Lord? Lord, give me a word. I'm all ears. I'm up high. Speak to me, Jesus. Anybody ever done this? Okay. So the Lord answered. Okay. If you're in here today, and you don't understand what you're going through right now in your life, Maybe you're not going through anything right now, but you will at some point because God uses seasons to mature us, right? So it's coming. This is for everybody in here. This is the Lord's answer to you, and I challenge every single one of us to do this because if you do it, it'll bless you. You ready? The Lord says to Habakkuk, and he's saying to you as well, he's saying to me as well, Number one, write the vision. Write the vision. Write the vision. Moms, dads, do you have a vision? You got a vision for your kids? Brothers and sisters in Christ, do you have a vision? Has God given you a vision? Do, do, do you understand God's will and purpose for your life? What is that? What is that? What is that vision? And if you know the answer to that vision, what does God say? Do write it down. Write it down. Watch what He says. Make it plain on tablets. In other words, if you're going to write your vision down, and listen, it may be a, it may be a toe sack full of stuff. You may have you may, this 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 this. God has given you all this. Write it down. Put it down. Men's like yeah, right. I hear you. I hear you, but I'm still challenging you. Write it where you can understand it. If you can't write where somebody can read, have your wife write it down. <laughs> Thank the Lord for our wives. That he may run who reads it. Now, who's normally going to read what you wrote down? You. Okay? Whatever God has given you, whatever season you're in, Whatever the vision is for this season, write it down. Are you teaching me? Are you maturing me? Are you challenging me? Are you encouraging me? I'm going to write specifically, Lord, what you're doing in my life. And when I read this, and I look at my life, and I read this, what I've written down for my children, and I read this, and I read this, what am I going to do with what I wrote, what God has given me? I'm going to run with it. I'm going to run with what he's given me. Run with it. Run with it. Run with it. I'm not just going to blow it off and nonchalantly do it. Go. No, he says write it down and then run with it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, for a season. But at the end, 
It will speak and it will not lie. This is for somebody right here. Though it tarries, though it tarries and you don't understand, what does it say, church? Wait for it because it will surely come and it will not tarry. Listen, there's the third one, wait. If you ever wanted three actions for visions, there they are. Write it down, run with it, and wait. But here's what you got to realize about wait. When you look up wait in the Hebrew, it's a little bit deep because it gives the picture of wick, wicker twisted, like you know how wicker furniture is twisted? It gives the idea of tw something twisted like vines. What does that mean? It means that while we're waiting, we twist and grab a hold of God's will and don't let go. See, a lot of people, when they wait, they just wait. But this kind of waiting is a preparation. This kind of, listen to me, church, this kind of waiting has action to it. So if you're waiting on the vision, and you're waiting on what God's doing in your life, and you're waiting in the season, you need to be preparing as you wait, because that's actually waiting is when you prepare. I think about Trisha, and I think about her son, and I'm thinking there's going to be a season that he's home. But while she's waiting, she's putting things into practice, putting things here, waiting, preparing for when this time comes. And then when it happens, she's not caught off guard, therefore everything's put in place. While you're waiting, you have to prepare. What are we doing while we're waiting on the Lord to come back? Are we prepared? Are we ready? Are, we, are you ready? If, if, he, if he was to roll in as soon as we say amen to get us, are you ready? Are you ready? Does everybody know you love them? Have you poured in? Have you, are you teaching? Are you passing things down? Are, are, are you, what are you doing while you're waiting? Are you sharing his love, sharing his word? What do you do while you're waiting? Listen, write it down. Run with it. Don't stop running. And wait. Wait. How, how, how are you preparing for the next season in your children's life? Don't wait till it gets there to start preparing. Prepare for it now. Is anybody praying for your child's spouse? See, God will give you a vision to look out a little further than you're looking right now. But here's what a lot of us do. We get to looking at the trees and we stop right there. We miss the whole forest. We miss the pinch point. We miss the creek bed. We miss all that because we're just focused on that right there. Your seasons are important in your life. Very important in your life. Because that's the training ground. The seasons are the training ground. You would bow your heads. If somebody told you you were jumping on a plane this evening and you go into Alaska, you wouldn't put on your bathing suit. No, you'd go digging around your closet and you get you get your heavy coat out. If somebody told you we was gonna go to go to the beach over in Desden or something. That's when you need your bathing suit. You, you, you put your coat up. Why would you do that? Because you understand what's coming and you prepare for it. In church, that's the same thing we do in these seasons, but if we don't recognize 
If you don't recognize, how are you going to adapt? If you don't know the step is there, how are you going to get in the back of the truck? Well, I know what we'll do. We'll go the hard way. We'll just bear it, grin and bear it, suffer through it. Standing there getting an uh, Eskimo hut with your bathing suit on. And all that sounds silly, but it's the same thing in the spiritual realm. And I wonder how many people right now, God has you on the changing table. But you've been looking at him and whining. Complaining. Kicking. You ever had one of them little babies, especially a little boy, that hits you right between the eyes with a scream? I wonder how many of us are doing that to God because we don't understand the season that we're in. Church, let him have his way. His ways are perfect. Don't lean on your own understanding. Jesus Christ came to this earth to save you, to redeem you, to love on you. Does that still get you stirred up? Because when you hear that, if you don't get excited, if you don't get humbled by that, then the devil has blinded you. I pray right now that you'd ask him, if that's you, to renew your passion, to renew your strength. Because it says those that prepare will mount up on wings like eagles, walk and not faint, not grow weary. You'll get the most out of your season. Father, I thank you for this time. What, what a blessing it is to just be with friends talking about our daddy. Lord, there's a lot we can say. There's a lot we can brag on. And Lord, I pray this bragging party doesn't stop right here. I pray it gets outside these doors. I pray this week especially we would brag on our daddy. We would brag on our Jesus. We would brag on the one that came to adopt us even though we went and hid under the bed. But you never left. Lord, you stayed right there. Until we finally come out from under the bed. And you reached your hand out to us. Oh, Lord, we don't deserve it. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Lord, I pray right now that you would encourage those that are going through something. That they're simply being taught matured, challenged, and encouraged. That you're not against them. <laughs> that you're for us. Lord, I thank you that you're for us. And I thank you for this time. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen.